The BBC Sessions was already a high demand bootleg by the time it was officially released in late 1997. Jimmy Page worked out his magic and presented his version of the historical recordings through a two CD set. It was the fifth Zeppelin release of the 90s, the first official live album since 1976, and also Atlantic Records' first Led Zeppelin live album. It made headlines but slowly lost momentum, fading away into the shadow of The Sun Remains the Same and later How the Wuss Was Won. Maybe it was the page plan on Jones defect, or just the timing was off. The curious case of BBC Sessions puzzles fans to this day. Some love it, some hate it. While it almost sold the exact same number of copies as No Quarter Unleaded, it maintained the band's name in the mainstream narrative and certainly helped Page and Plan's future plans. 1997 is one of my favorite years from the 90s. I was 10 years old and a 5th grade kid who was into the Beatles, early year Santana, 70s soul music, and one group that nowadays is a guilty pleasure for many. Their first hit single Wanna Be was everywhere, but I thought the vocals were a bit annoying. It was the video for Say You'll Be There that made me fall in love with Ginger Spice. I was infatuated with her. Like millions of kids, I had a serious crush on the redhead Spice Girl. A rockstar charisma, crazy attitude and an iconic stage presence made her a star. I also liked Sporty Spice. Her confidence was very appealing for my 10 year old self. Her voice was the band's secret weapon. I believe she was the John Paul Jones of this band. While their debut album from 1996 had great hits including To Become One and Who Do You Think You Are, I felt it lacked the consistency on the deeper cuts, thus I never bought a copy. It was her follow up, 1997's Spice World, the record that got me hooked on the music beyond their looks. I got it on cassette and wore out the tape. At 14 million copies sold, it was a perfect collection of British pop songs crafted by an all-star cast of musicians, engineers and producers. I know what you're thinking, are you serious JCM? Trust me on this one, it's one of my top 10 records next to Led Zeppelin. This was a well-constructed product that went beyond a bubblegum approach, from salsa to samba, from Motown to doo-wop and disco. It was a perfect album for the Spice Girls to take over the world like the 90s Beatles. Round up the world premiere of the Spice World movie in December and I was as happy as a kid could be with a behind the scenes look at the world of Melanie Brown, Melanie Chisholm, Emma Bunton, pre Beckham Victoria Adams and my personal favorite, Jerry or Getty Halliwell. The movie was goofy and had a bad script, yes, but who cared? We saw them perform songs from the new album and heard their voices behind the music. Like the Beatles help in the 60s and the song remains the same in the 70s, this was my British Invasion, led by Ginger Spice and her iconic outfit. 1997 was also the year I got my first CD ever. It was Billboard Hits 1966, a very nice Christmas gift from my father. Every track on this album shaped my music taste for years to come. Good Vibrations still gives me goosebumps. And yes, I celebrated the Bulls 4 championship with my black jersey on. It was a great time to be a Bulls fan, and a crappy time to be a Utah Jazz fan. Fast forward 2002, I was 15, living in a small country with little access to Led Zeppelin. Outside of the VHS concert, I had no other live reference. A CD copy of the song Remains the Same was still a year or two away. I didn't know people traded bootlegs, so the official release path was the way to go. I went to the supermarket one day and looked through their vast CD collection. There it was, the wide album cover BBC Sessions staring at me. I was bummed out from the underwhelming experience of Unleaded, so I had to be sure of this purchase. The two CD set had a special single album price. Checked the track listing and to my surprise, I saw many songs from the first four albums I owned and nothing from latter days. I asked my mom if I could get it, she smiled and knew by then her son had a fever and the only prescription was Led Zeppelin. My sales pitch was the classic, it's a two CD set for the price of one. Mom, this is a great deal and look, it has two versions of Hola Love. My mom loved that song. Funds were provided and I went to the cashier. Back home I studied this record. CD number one was somewhat unpleasant. These raw sounding sessions took me a while to digest because of the contrast to Led Zeppelin 1's exquisite mix and Led Zeppelin 2's architecture. My ears were spoiled and accustomed to the producer genius of James Patrick. Nevertheless, the commanding presence of the band was undeniable. The biggest revelation from CD 1 was of course Traveling Riverside Blues. I was hooked the minute I heard it. The drums sounded better than the previous songs and the mix moved close to Led Zeppelin 1. This went straight to my ever-changing mixtapes for my daily high school routines, trying to find someone to tell about the new Zeppelin 2 I discovered. 
This song made me want to be a teenager in the 70s and take my lady on the Vista Cruiser. So she squeezed my lemon till the juice ran down my leg. Next song was Hold Out of Love. To this day, I think it rivals its studio counterpart with its high octane dynamics, crystal clear cymbals, and one of Jimmy's best guitar tones ever. I was absorbed by the whole thing. The rest of the songs I had a complicated relationship with for years until my Zeppelin studies made me understand their historical significance. CD number two was a first row seat into the unknown. I absolutely love the metallic sounding bass and concert hall effect here. As a guitar student, I was motivated to say the least. The page and plan dynamic was brutal. The band was insanely good, performers of the highest caliber. My third ever exposure to a live Days and Confused was a ritual and heavy competitor to the VHS movie. The intimacy of this musical research facility was my secret weapon to face the classic rock haters in school. You should have seen the look on their face of my teachers when I played this in class for the first time. Mind you, it was a Christian high school, so you can imagine what happened later, right? Closing track, Thank You, was a deal breaker into absolutely hating Unleaded. John Bonham smashing the drums and Jimmy's graceful soloing over D major was marvelous. Always the left behind piece from the discography, it seems. Its impact within our Zeppelin community cannot be overlooked. But how did this project happen? Why did Page wait till 1997? Why a two CD set? I'll answer all these questions, but first, here's a fun fact for you. Did you know who played the O2 Arena in 2007, right after Led Zeppelin? You guessed it, the Spice Girls, for the reunion tour. I couldn't get tickets for neither artists. This is a story of a live document that captured unique snapshots of a band conquering both sides of the Atlantic. A rite of passage for English bands. The British Broadcasting Corporation archives restored and produced by Jimmy Page. The live album that will always have a black and white sound in our heads. A record that I have three copies of, including a special edition with rare interviews. The Zeppelin's own white album. This is the making of BBC Sessions. Oh, here we go. We've got the old red light up for you, boys. We're in the studio. We've got Led Zeppelin for you. And uh, I'll reel them off. John Bonham, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones. By the time Led Zeppelin ever stepped in the door at the BBC, they had played 51 shows together, including multiple concert runs such as the first Scandinavian tour, the UK tour 1968, and 130 day US tour in late December 68 until February of 1969. With their first album already on the shelves, the BBC sessions were the right venture to perfect their craft and capture the fast paced velocity of their first six months in the business, going from the New Yardbirds into Led Zeppelin. With Peter Grant's future policy of hunting down people recording their shows without permission, the growing popularity of these UK sessions was just natural. An official BBC release of one of the most bootleg bands of all time was long overdue. BBC sessions released up to 1997 included The Beatles, Curve There, Dire Straits, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac, The Jimi Hendrix Experience, Radio 1 from 1988, Queen, and Yes. Led Zeppelin's take on these sessions helped to push the concept towards a profitable venture for many future archive albums that followed like The Who, Cream and Jimi Hendrix. Unlike the American FM radio stations in the 60s that saw a major transformation towards popular music, the BBC was a bipolar creature. On the one hand they didn't care that much about rock and roll albums, but at the same time offered live shows as a way for bands to promote their own material. Led Zeppelin took advantage of this opportunity and became regulars. The BBC tried to release Zeppelin's recordings on their own, but didn't get permission from Page out of his intent to release a chronological live album in the 70s that never took off. Past the song remains the same, Zeppelin fans had been teased with limited official concert archives via Coda and Box Set 1990. It wasn't until late 1996 going into 1997 when Jimmy put his eyes on the BBC project that would be relatively easy to produce. With the page and plan on Jones thing on standby and the renewed interest in Zeppelin by proxy, BBC sessions kept Page busy and some extra profits wouldn't hurt anybody. Jimmy heard the recordings throughout the years and loved the graphic detail of Zeppelin's organic sound. First step was to ask the BBC for the stuff they had. An engineer was sent with DAT copies of their performances. No quarter inch master tapes were sent, thus Page assumed everything was transferred to digital with the original tapes wiped out. 
The D.A.T. sounded horrible. I'm guessing as bad as Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell. Jimmy pulled out his cassette copy instead and the sound was much better. Page realized this must have been transferred from a different source. He followed his heart and found the master tapes in the BBC's vaults after a long search. The tapes were not erased and survived almost 30 years of storage. This was good news. There's just no resisting it. 1969 Dodge Charger. Excitement only Charger can claim. A new look up here, wide new taillights back here, and a wild new V8 performance in here. Dodge Fever. More forceful than ever. Dodge is turning up the fever now. To avoid getting lost in the story, I will be discussing all 24 songs from the 1997 release first. With all streaming platforms carrying the complete BBC sessions, I had to revisit my personal copies for this episode. CD1 is comprised of four sessions from 1969. These were recorded on the UK Spring Tour and the UK Summer Concert Run as well. First BBC session for the Top Gear program was recorded on March 3rd at the Playhouse Theatre London during their United Kingdom and Scandinavia tour which ran from March 1st till April 17th 1969. The famous Danish TV and Super Show videos were shot during this tour as well. You Shook Me, I Can't Quit You Baby and Days and Confused were transmitted by the BBC on March 23rd. Jimmy claimed in a Guitar World interview that he played his famous Dragon Telecaster on all 1969 sessions. While this sounds reasonable, concert photographs and video from this time period show his recently acquired Les Paul guitar. You be the judge. I like to think it was all the Telecaster's last stand before one of Page's friends ruined the instrument with a bad paint job, thus the guitar was retired. Jimmy took out the neck and used it on his brown Telecaster instead. Their USA tour in the spring and between the first and second BBC sessions was a historic feat that included their famous Fillmore and Boston Tea Party shows, which boosted their confidence, number of groupies, musicianship, and determination to make it. Second BBC session for Chris Grant's Tasty Pop Sunday was recorded on June 16th at Aeolian Hall Studio 2 in London. This is the same venue where Page and Plant recorded the last part of their No Quarter project. Yeah, this is the same place where Kashmir with the Egyptian Orchestra was recorded. Only three days away from their famous Toussaint Scene show in France, this second session saw them perform Communication Breakdown, The Girl I Love, She Got Long Black Wavy Hair, and something else. The show was transmitted by the BBC on June 22nd. Hey. Let's speak to John Paul Jones first. Uh, now, I believe that uh, you are a musical arranger as well as a composer. Is this true? A musical arranger as well as a composer? Yes. No. A composer as well as a musical arranger? No, a musical arranger as well as a bass guitarist. <laughs> musical. Can we do this again? Because yeah, once more, okay. Cut it. Cut it. Here we go. Too close, uh, too far. Oh, wipe it too, too close. You wipe it. Okay, we're in the studio with the Led Zeppelin now, and uh, first of all, I'm going to speak to Robert Plant, who's uh, lead vocalist and also plays harmonica. Hi, Robert. How do you do? Uh, how long have you been with the group, in fact? Um, I don't know. However long it's been going, I should think about seven or eight months now. Mm. And uh, you must surely get very tired when you're singing you know, this tremendous pace. How do you manage to sort of sustain this? Sort of well, I don't sustain. I just, I just keep clapping out. <laughs> We've been working a lot and with the radios and things like mm. that. You bit by bit, you resistance drops and drops and drops. Uh, let's speak to now uh, Mr. John Bonham, who's drums, timpani and backing vocal. Hello, John. Hello. Hey. What uh, sort of things were you doing before Led Zeppelin was formed? Um, nothing really. I just played with Tim Rose for mm -hmm. about um, two months before joining Led Zeppelin. But mm -hmm. before that, nothing sort of worth mentioning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And uh, we've also got Jimmy Page here, who on the album cover in front of me here says, Electri electric guitar, acoustic guitar, pedal steel guitar and backing vocal. You seem to be pretty busy here. Uh, I also hear that you've, uh, you know, you've been a very successful uh, session musician before Led Zeppelin. Is this true? Yes, quite a bit before Led Zeppelin, actually. Mm. Um, 
Sorry, Jimmy, you're right off mic, mate. Can we just get, go into Jimmy again, please, and get on get on the live side, can you? Yeah, we can oh. we can cut. We can... Yeah, but he couldn't hear him. Couldn't hear him. Third BBC session saw them return to Top Gear on June 24th, 1969, at Maida Vale Studio 4 in London. They played What Is and What Should Never Be, Communication Breakdown, Traveling Riverside Blues, and Hold of Love. Jimmy got the chance to add overdubs on these sessions, which allowed the band to offer a sneak peek at what their second album would be. The show was transmitted on June 29th. Fourth BBC session was held on June 27th with a second visit to the Playhouse Theatre London. Songs captured that evening included Communication Breakdown, I Can't Quit You Baby, You Shook Me, and How Many More Times. All these were transmitted on August 10th, 1969. Good evening and welcome to the Led Zeppelin Show. The purpose of the program tonight is to provide a platform which allows bands removed from the normal confines of the record industry and free from commercial manipulation to present a true statement about their music. Bands we know as underground, heavy, rock, blues, progressive do have a limited outlet on mass media shows. On my left, Robert Plant, the lead vocalist, and you also play harmonica, Robert, right? Uh, when permitting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on my right, Jimmy Page, lead guitarist. You find that you're restricted to say a four minute or five minute number and you know all the groups now tend to sort of stretch their numbers and it gets quite a problem you know you get well you know you end up doing say a couple of blues numbers and nothing more you know because it's uh, short. that's it yeah right but you you do enjoy freedom freedom of expression in other areas of your work for instance in the studio five years ago even the beatles would take what one day to cut a complete album they didn't seem to have freedom to plan and produce well, they were paying for the, <laughs> the studio time, you see. You could do one of your longer numbers. Feel free to do anything you like. <laughs> Great. And when we finish that, uh, <laughs> we'll be well out of breath. Um, Their fifth and final BBC session took place right at the end of their UK and Ireland Spring Tour on April 1st, 1971, at the Paris Theatre London. Recorded for the In Concert radio series, these were highly anticipated as Led Zeppelin had now three albums under their belt, plus selling out big arenas in the United States, including two shows on the same day at Madison Square Garden. The performance was originally scheduled for March 25th, but was postponed to give Robert's vocal cords a much thinner break from the Back to the Clubs tour that included the famous live debut of Stairway to Heaven in Belfast. This 1971 show was transmitted live on the BBC airwaves to great success. The Led Zeppelin 4 mindset was on, but it was still a long way until the album's release date in November. Three cuts, Since I've Been Loving You, Black Dog and Thank You, were not originally transmitted by the BBC. May 11th, 1971. Jimmy oversaw the mono two-track to stereo mixing of their April 1st in-concert performance. Documents found years later reveal how Jimmy stepped in after Led Zeppelin and the BBC had a disagreement over the sound quality. The day after the broadcast, Led Zeppelin withdrew their approval and demanded a recording not to be available worldwide. The black and white artwork was comprised of several photographs from the band's early days. While you would like to think they were taken from the actual BBC sessions, that's far away from the truth. The individual shots from the inside booklet shows Bonham at Bath 1970. Page's picture was taken from a 1968 promotional shoot. Based on Robert's shirt and its decorations, this one comes from backstage at Bath 1969, where Zeppelin played on June 28th. Jones's photo comes from an October 1969 show at Lyceum Ballroom, London. The image behind the CD plaque is from the Two Cent Scene show in France on June 19, 1969. Now onto the album cover. Judging from his mustache, Plant's photo was taken from Bath 1970. Page seems to be lifted off a series of backstage shots on the same October 1969 Lyceum show. Bonham's photograph was cut out from the Two Cent Scene show in France. One hint that gives it away is the scarf. 
Jones's pick throws out the timeline by two years, as it comes from Led Zeppelin's 1973 show in Southampton. Of all the early day shots they had of Jones, why they went with this one is strange. The booklet also featured a group photograph backstage at Bath Festival 1970. This image seems to have been flipped horizontally, as the rest of the photos from the session show Jones standing on the right side. Jimmy Page made the use of Pro Tools to trim down some bits and pieces from these performances. All of Robert Plant's original chatter with the audience before the songs was removed. The 96-minute Paris Theatre Show was edited down to fit the 80-minute CD capacity of 1997. As you would imagine, Her Little Love had three parts cut out from its blues medley, Honey Bee, For What It's Worth, and The Lemon Song. Although it was done for time constraints, you wonder why it wasn't restored for the complete BBC sessions of 2016. I suspect the real reason for these edits came down to royalties and copyright checks handed out to other publishers. A similar thing happened on How the West Was Won, with Page actually removing a segment from the already edited version of Hold of Love. So going back to the BBC sessions, there's also quick edits in Dazed and Confused and millimetric parts of Heartbreaker. Here's an audio summary of what was left out in the editing room. Okay, this is, uh, this is something we've waited for a long time on the Sunday, repeated on Wednesday show, and uh, I know it's all going to be well worth the wait. So would you welcome please Led Zeppelin. just gave up altogether. So we hope it's all in condition tonight, but if it's not, cheer, because you're on the radio. This is another thing of the fourth album. It's called Stairway to Heaven. The gap is caused by John tuning in his bass pedal. It sounds like Bridget the Midget, doesn't it? And that's why I said 55 million or 52 million or whatever. With the help of John and everybody else, we're going to get it by, I think. Right. He's got his medallions and his, his leather suit, I believe. So. I was really knocked out that so many people came to see me tonight. You know, so. And if I say to you tomorrow... Hold on. <laughs> Finish forever. Mailbag on the Melody Maker would have had a treat. <laughs> I can imagine it up at the rear now. Worth 
fighting for. But in the future, the greatest threat to our survival will not be man at all. Prepare for battle and journey to the front lines of the next frontier. Kill them all! Starship Troopers. BBC Sessions was released on November 17th, 1997, in a classic rock market of Fleetwood Mac, selling 5.5 million units for The Dance, Hendrix and Lennon's greatest hits at 2.5 and 3.5 million respectively, and The Stones' Bridges to Babylon at 2.6 million. One of my personal favorite songs by The Stones comes from this album. It's the Keith Richards tune by the name of How Can I Stop. Also on the market was the Yardbirds' own BBC Sessions, with Jimmy Page on tracks 21 to 26. The track by the name of The Sun Is Shining is very similar to You Shook Me. Check it out. But of course, the great revival record from 1997 was Buena Vista Social Club, with sales of 12 million units. The sound of Cuban heritage became a world music anthem of brotherhood and celebration. Ray Cooter struck gold with this collaboration that remains one of the greatest recordings of the 20th century. So back to the original BBC Sessions release. CD1 starts off with a great three-part mini-suite that works as a perfect showcase of their early day set. The Jones and Bonham interplay here steals the show. It confirms just how essential they were in a Zeppelin sound and impact. Communication Breakdown I find it to be the most powerful take from the menu, with a saturated crunch that preceded punk by many years. Taste and Confuse is good but somewhat limited. Go for the Super Show version instead. The girl I love, she got long black wavy hair, is fun, but outside of being a proto Moby Dick riff, it gets tiring after a while. Next four cuts from the Top Gear session speak of their personal conviction to deliver the goods. From the timeless groove of traveling Riverside Blues, next to the dramatic versions of future Zeppelin 2 numbers. Communication Breakdown from this session was played well, but you can sense this type of song slowly feeling out of place for their ambitions. Something Else is a great tribute to Eddie Cochran with Jones on piano. It's a nice window into their 1971 feature of rock and roll. Next three songs are great, but I spotted a major difference compared to the opening numbers from this CD. They are played at a faster tempo, which is especially noticeable in You Shook Me. You feel the band has jammed out these songs so much by June 27, 1969. They need new challenges. Closing track How Many More Times is a great ending for the set, and a front row experience to the explosive nature of the early day life beast. Their never ending source of New Yorkers juvenile energy at the time is a gem worth revisiting. Okay, now on to CD number two. What can I say? I believe the entire concert start to finish is tremendous, splendid, breathtaking. Not a single weak number here. This is like a greatest hits live collection. Most valuable player award goes to John Paul Jones. The way he compliments Jimmy's low distortion guitars turns the affair into a masterclass in musical telepathy. Although Robert's vocals show the signs of incessant touring, he's not intimidated by the massive wall of sound behind him. He leaves a historic mark throughout the set. Jimmy's masterful command of dynamics drive the compositions to emotional highs one after another. Bonham's dominance from start to finish crowns him as the engine and soul of Led Zeppelin. I believe the band's work on Since I've Been Loving You and Days and Confused rivals The Song Remains the Same because of their intimate setting and the element of surprise before massive stadiums forced them to somewhat script their shows. This 1971 concert is quite the luxury, really. It's a photograph of a group branching out from their blues jams into their own style and preparation for their mystique behind closed doors. CD1 is a perfect entry for the main course at the Paris Theatre. They never play Stairway to Heaven like this again. Can't blame them either. Rockstars pay a prize for their anthems, right? I had actually, uh, uh, nearly 20 years ago, done the CD versions of the, uh, uh, of the BBC sessions and um, there was a lot of material that was left off because of the amount that you could get on a CD. How really. different does what we heard tonight compared to the original BBC session tapes that you first got? Um, well, um, the, the running order is obviously totally different to, to, uh, to how, well, is it? Yeah, it is. It's moved around a little bit from, from, what, from, from what the broadcasts are, but it's, but it's clearly noted what, what is what. So, yeah, I've been, I've been doing this for, for quite a while, because what you have to understand is, when, with all of those companion discs, it, it, it all takes 
listening in real time. There's no shortcuts. So, uh, yeah, I've been involved in it for quite a while, and uh, that's, that, that's good. So maybe it's time to sort of dust down the guitar for next year, I think, yeah? That's yeah. good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Page, thank you very much indeed. Thank you all very much. Thank you, and thank you, Johnny. Thank you. <laughs> Announced in 2016 with much attention from the media but mixed reactions from the Zeppelin community, the complete BBC sessions shed light on missing tracks from the puzzle. My honest reaction back then was like, new tracks? Okay, cool, but I just hope they don't repeat themselves with more versions of the same songs. Oh, never mind. Because this album was getting some reissue love, I said, what the hell, I'll buy it. I was never overly excited about it, but you know what? The sound is better especially when cranking up the volume on the 1971 show. So for that, I say job well done. The track list and design for the complete BBC sessions is a complete mess for the obsessive compulsive fan. Neither the back cover nor the CDs have any useful information. So how can we find out? You go with the booklet, of course. But here lies a big, big problem. From a user experience standpoint, it's a disaster. I blame the label for this. It's the worst listing I've ever seen on a classic rock release. Instead of a separate track listing for each CD, we get a list of all six BBC sessions and their respective venues plus recording and broadcasting dates. Each song states the CD where it comes from, as if they expect casual fans to be that patient. So for example, session one shows all four songs, but look at the CD notes in very fine print. CD three, track one. CD one, track four. CD one, track one. And CD one, track two. So you'd think they would add the CD track listing at the end, right? Wrong. They decided to list the songs with no alphabetical order, plus the CD locations for each version without recording dates. So to get a hold of the track listing, you have to take out a pen and paper to write down the freaking details. This is one of the reasons I haven't listened to my physical media copy more than once since I bought it. Go to Spotify and all the tracks have the original broadcast dates on them instead of the recording dates. If you ask me, I think having the recording dates makes more sense as it contributes to the timeline effect of these archives. You don't want people thinking that Zeppelin recorded a portion of the BBC sessions on August 10th, 1969 when they were actually touring the States. Okay, so what was in the third bonus CD from this release? We got two extra cuts from the March 3rd and June 16th sessions that were not on the original release. Next, we got two additional Payhouse Theater numbers from June 27th, with Days and Confused being the only real surprise here, as White Summer was included on Box Set 1990 and the expanded Coda versions from 1993 and 2015. Next, we got two rocking numbers from the 1971 set at the Paris Theater. Last but not least, we got three tracks from the March 19th date at Meta Vale Studios, which was technically their second BBC session, which was omitted from the 1997 release. These were taken from a sort of bootleg recording as the original tapes were wiped out. Thus, the sound quality is subpar compared to the rest. Is this third disc any good? Well, kinda. I think there's a reason they were not included the first time around. Track 1 has a guitar somewhat lost in the mix. Track 2 and 3 are not better than the 1969 versions from CD1. Track 4, White Summer, we already had, so I guess it's good, right? Track 5 from the 1971 show was one of the promotional cuts for the 2016 campaign and I can understand why. While the execution is flawless overall, it doesn't have the same impact as the rest of the Paris Theater show. Track 6 has the problem early day Zeppelin tracks had when the band revisited them past the release of Red Zeppelin 3. Let me just state that for problem I mean shape and form. Whether it was their extreme performances in a period of just two years, or the fact that they were evolving at such a rapid pace, they can seem to flow the same with this type of material. The best years for their debut album stuff is 1968 to early 1970. Tops. Past that is just like hanging out with an ex-girlfriend, you know? It's nice, but oh by the way, there's a weird electronic sound in the background during the funk jam section. It's distracting as hell. Last three cuts are for historic purposes only. While the sound quality is average bootleg at best, the performances are surprisingly good. I Can Quit You Baby is violent, with one of Jimmy's finest guitar runs I've heard him play on this song. You Shook Me rivals the opening cut from CD1. It has better playing, I believe. Sunshine Woman is like the less attractive sister song to Traveling Riverside Blues, with proper credit given to Willie Dixon. Despite the tape quality, Led Zeppelin rocks hard, 
with that crunchy heaviness of 1969. With 24 tracks on the original release plus 9 bonus tracks in the 2016 edition, there's a lot to choose from, and if not in the proper mindset, to get real bored from. The issue with the 1969 cuts is the similarity in sound and style. I know Paige likes to brag about them changing numbers night after night, but there's just so much 1969 BBC sessions you can handle without ear fatigue. Listening to everything on a single sit down will make your eyes see black and white after 5 versions of Communication Breakdown plus 3 takes of You Shook Me, I Can Quit Your Baby, Days and Confused, and What Is and What Should Never Be. Colors will slowly fade into sameness. The sonic uniformity despite the explosive performances turned the expanded version into an unnecessary exercise in shape and form. I suspect the guys from Greta Van Fleet were forced to listen to live versions of Communication Breakdown night and day when they were kids. Of course we hardcore Zeppelin fans are thankful for the bonus CD, but do we really need it? I say no. While the extra stuff is nice, I would like to share my list of how this 2 CD album should be. This is the right amount of BBC sessions. CD1 would start off with Communication Breakdown from Tasty Pop Sunday June 16th 1969 followed by something else for a fast tempo rock and roll greeting. Next I included both March 19th low tape quality takes of I Can't Quit Your Baby and You Shook Me. The performances are that good. Days and Confused from March 3rd 1969 follows for a 6.5 minute visit to their music lab. Next we have three songs from the June 24th Top Gear session to celebrate the power of the Zeppelin 2 vibes. I just can't get enough of traveling Riverside Blues and Holiday Love. How many more times from June 27th is next in a fitting position as the show's closing number. That's 9 songs that summarize the 1969 BBC sessions with guitar, bass, drums and vocals firing on all 6 cylinders. Rest assured you won't skip any of these tracks. So for CD2 I did a test and added the tracks that were left out from the 1971 show. To my surprise, neither What Is and What Should Never Be nor Communication Breakdown enhance the concert experience. I can't point my finger as to why, but I can only say there's a reason they were left out in 1997 to fit the 80 minute time limit. So there you have it, 33 tracks cut down to 19. As they say, less is more. Before the larger than life vibrations of the dominant band from the 70s, back in 69 there were just four guys trying to make it in the music business. They evolved from young men fighting the world with the blues, to concert staple identities carved from the depths of creativity in motion. BBC Sessions is that yearbook we rarely go back to, but if we take the chance, we will be revitalized by memories, victories, broken promises, lessons, and many versions of the same person, the one we see in the mirror. Thank you very much for watching guys, stay tuned for the next episode, take care, bye bye. To avoid getting lost in the story, I will be discussing all 24 songs from the 1997 release first. With all streaming platforms carrying the complete BBC sessions, I had to revisit my personal copies for this episode. CD1